All right, my friends. Feels like it's been a while. It's nice to be back, if only briefly. Now I'm jet lagged with a bit of fever, so I'm feeling a little discombobulated. I must ask you to forgive any incoherence on my part. But I really wanted to take a look at the latest offering from Reebok because it's something I think many of us have been waiting for: a large, respectably sized sauropod, my favorite dinosaur group, and not just any sauropod, but Diplodocus, one of the most iconic ones. I have to catch another flight in a while, so I'll just do one video now and part two later. We all know Diplodocus, so I won't spend too much time gilding the lily. The name Diplodocus means double beam, from the Greek diplos for double, and dokos meaning beam, and refers to these double chevrons or hemal arches on the underside of the tail here. And this was then deemed a unique feature, though we now know other sauropods also had them. On the other hand, the names Reba gave them deserve some mention. The female, the one with the closed mouth, is called Catch the Rainbow. This comes from the song of the same name by the rock band Rainbow. Then the male with the open mouth is Stargazer, yet another song by the same band. Though for me, my association of Stargazer comes from quite a different place. As you'd expect, this model comes in separate parts to keep the boxes small. And I wanted to appreciate how compact the box actually is if we compare them in size to the Wilson T-Rex. Inside, the Diplodocus comes in three parts. You have the head and neck, the tail, then the anchor piece, the very solid bludgeon-like body. The tail goes in easily out of the box, while the neck requires a bit of hair drying. But when fitted together, the seam lines are rather hard to see if you don't jiggle them out of alignment. The model is based on Diplodocus carnegii, which has been estimated to be between 24 to 26 meters, or 78.7 to 85.3 feet. And it measures about 83 centimeters, or 32.7 inches. And taking the median of 25 meters, or 82 feet, we get 1 to 30 of scale. Diplodocus helorum is 29 to 32 meters long, and if you want to take that measurement bracket instead, you'd get just 1 to 35 scale on 29 meters or 95 feet long. So here's how we'd look next to it. The model weighs about 880 grams or 1.9 pounds. Both of these variants are obviously the same on the whole, except for the head. So for the detail, let's just look at the male. We might have noticed that my recent Haolongku reviews have squeezed two variants in the same video, but being a sauropod, you know I'll just have too much to say for that. So today we'll look at the male stargazer in detail, which will apply to the female as well, since they're obviously the same mold. In part 2, which I'll do when I get back next week, we'll look at the female, how it compares to the male, some background science, and then comparisons with other models. So on to Stargazer. We'll start at the head. Now even in this one small area, you're already hit by the detail. As you can see, there's plenty of scale variability between areas like the face and around the eyes. Now this mosaic of scale detail is very organic looking, with larger ones in the face. And even in areas like the folds of the neck, you'll see scales of different shapes, sizes, and depth. The eye is painted nicely with a shiny gloss. Unfortunately, at this very close range, you see a seam between head and neck and also separating the mandible. And both of these will be quite hard to see at normal viewing distances. And from the top, you can see that red accent. 
and more of that meticulous scale detail. Without being too nitpicky, one thing that jumps out to me is the thinness of the premaxillary area. It seems a bit too shallow to accommodate both premaxilla and the teeth. If you factor in the teeth, it looks like there should be just a little bit more depth. This is more obvious in the open mouth male, and less so in the closed mouth female. The slight downturn of the dentary is also missing, so you don't have that chin look. Naturally, some of you might want to make a decision fast, so let me just give you a quick comparison of the two heads. And back to the male, there's a little pliability here, so we can have a look inside. You see the tongue here. Maybe a bit of teeth, but otherwise not much else to look at. And speaking of pliability, a USP of this model is the articulation it affords. There's some bendability here, but caution should be taken. Now, I'm not comfortable at all bending it up and down, but I can give you an idea of the lateral flex here. I really hope it holds up, as I heard that for Rebor's Titanoboa, there were plenty of cracking complaints. In mine, you can already see where there's some exposed metal here, in a split in the skin. But let me see if I can shine a light on it. Now hopefully it's just this one freak, because if we take a quick look at the female, there's no such flaw. So don't go panicking about this yet, yours might be fine. Detail-wise, as we move down the neck, you'll see the representative aesthetic everywhere else. Namely, at first glance, it looks like just wrinkles, similar to those of all dinosaur models and nothing to write home about. However, on closer inspection, you see that within each of these folds, or wrinkles, there are very minute scales. And that's really the wonderful thing about the skin in this model. And just in this one area, you'll see the variety of detail which you'll also see elsewhere. I like the muted colours not just in the skin, but also the midline osteoderms. Now these are quite soft, making them a bit more resilient to breakage. You'll see, however, that the overall colour is rather limited in palette, which goes with a huge animal like this. And the body itself is where it's even more obvious just how much texturing Rebor has done. Of course, at this scale, one might argue we shouldn't be able to make out much scale detail, and I think it's time to give it a rest, since we all know this. The only question is, can texture be offered while looking naturalistic? And the answer in this case is yes. As we saw in the neck, a cursory first glance shows you a very wrinkly sauropod with plenty of creases and skin folds. In fact, it doesn't look very impressive, being like models of yesteryear. But that would be a mistake. Firstly, you'll appreciate that even with just the wrinkles, there's a difference in coarseness and fineness in different regions. But look a bit more closely, and you'll see that within these creases, we have very fine and tiny scales. The idea is more clearly seen here in the original 3D concept, with an infusion of tiny scales on the skin surface. And that's just what you see reproduced in the actual model. 
As far as the colour goes, I like how it's not gaudy, but even in the relative drabness, you'll see a mix of colour blends. I like also how subtly these vertical stripes bend down, especially in conjunction with these spinal scutes running down the length of the animal. Now I've talked a bit about posture in my PNSO Maman Seesaurus review. Our differences in reconstruction depend on various factors such as relative length and attitude of the limbs, where the limb girdle sits, and to what extent the postsacral dorsal deflection of the tail base, as described by Vidal 2020, is reproduced. Any permutation of these results in different appearances. In Frenoids, you see the horizontal epatosaurian posture that used to be the default, until we learned how common the downsloping Macronarian one really was. The pelvic and shoulder girdles are quite level, with a slight rise and then fall over the sacral area. In Dr. Scott Hartman's reconstruction, there's a slight bias resulting in a very slight downward sloping posture. The postsacral upward deflection results in less of a dip in the tail. And in Gunnar Bivens' reconstruction, you actually see a more macronarian posture with downsloping dorsals, so that even with a more upwardly deflected tail base than in the Scott Hartman, you don't get much of an upward kink. So it's really fascinating to see how different people approach reconstruction of the same dinosaur. And here, Rebor has chosen a rather traditional construct. It adopts the more or less horizontal posture we're accustomed to seeing in diplodocene sauropods. However, there's a slight upslope, quite different from other reconstructions with a rise and fall. It also reflects the more upward deflection caused by sacral wedging, and I'll leave it to you as to which you prefer. And just the ones over here in the hind limbs, down to the legs, and toes. And then down the arm, we see how detailed and muscled it is, though not to the extent of the Pepo bodybuilder Brachio. You see here how what looks like the Brachioradial is curving down into the forearm here. differentiation between the metacarpals are rather distinct in this model. Not forgetting that all-important thumb claw. Now, I've recently had the opportunity to look at a diplodocus hand, and it's really noticeable how this sticks out, even without the overlying keratin. Later titanosaurs would of course lose even these. And now we have the tail, and going down we can see both the detailed tiny scales and also the subtle way the stripes are rendered. I'm really so happy seeing the minuteness of these scales, and also how subtly and naturally the coloration looks. I do like some color, but in larger animals, I like them subtle. On the right side, you'll notice some of these holes. There's a wire armature inside the tail, and these holes facilitate holding it in place and keeping it centered during the manufacturing process. Because there's less material around this wire frame compared to the neck, I'm a lot more comfortable flexing it. 
And as you can see, the range of motion is remarkable. And here's the model put together. I think you can see at once how majestic it is. It really is a different feeling to have a decently sized sauropod because huge size is a feature of many of them. So to have a model do it justice, it has to have some size to it. The pose is stately and dignified and the poseability helps recreate the feelings I had when I first feasted my eyes on walking with dinosaurs. In fact, I'd suggest that you pose it often to keep it pliable and not cause it to set, so to speak, and then lead to cracking if you change the pose only after a year or more. Any angle, really, the majesty of the Diplodocus is admirably demonstrated. Beautiful. Alright, so much for Stargazer. Now I've got to go pack and then catch a plane, but next week we'll catch the rainbow instead. Till then, let me know what you think and have a good weekend.